last year's Aquila in an interactive and uh, hopefully a very enriching uh, fashion. Um, Dr. Rubesh as a researcher is uh, remarkable in that he not only has a tremendous bandwidth in uh, the field of arth adult reconstruction surgery in basic sciences and uh, cytology and histology, uh, but also biomechanics and outcome studies are part of his oeuvre. He also is a trauma surgeon at heart and um, has really uh, just uh, accumulated an incredible uh, bandwidth of publications over the years. So it's just a very small uh, aspect of uh, his uh, knowledge that we'll see today. He's also a true class act and uh, he enjoys cars and uh, you can see him here amongst some of our residents in the LeMay Museum, which was his activity of choice yesterday afternoon. And our residents texted me throughout uh, uh, the day I was in the operating room with uh, a lot of tempting cars. He's also an outstanding driver and he qualifies for German highway speeds and beyond, <laughs> as you can see here, and there's no crash. So it's with uh, tremendous pleasure uh, that I introduce to you our uh, 40, is it actually the 49th? 49th. So I misspoke, it's the 49th historic John LeCocq lecturer, Dr. Harry Rubash from Boston. Thank you, Well, Good morning, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I did get up to 220 miles an hour, but I did not make it one lap at Indy, which was the course that I was driving at 220 miles an hour without hitting the wall. So despite all of that work, I didn't make it. My, my roots are uh, trauma. In fact, I started out as a trauma surgeon thinking that I was going to do traumatology. And my interest, my keen interest was in uh, pelvic and acetabular fractures. And I had the chance to work with Emile Letronel and Marvin Tile, Dana Mears, and some of the others. And I, I realized early on that I, I had a great passion for uh, the adult hip. <clears throat> and so part of my training was uh, doing an AO fellowship. And so the AO fellowship in those days was anywhere from six to 12 weeks. So I, I applied for an AO fellowship and I got it and ended up being assigned to Burnt Cloudy uh, in Munich, and Jens Chapman was my host. And so he uh, <clears throat> took care of me and Kim, my wife, uh, for a period of time. I stayed in their family flat. They had a little flat on Effnerplatz, wasn't that right, Effnerplatz, near, uh, <clears throat> near the Marriott. And I got to go in and out of the hospital and had a great deal of fun, learned, learned a lot, got to travel through Europe, and <clears throat> those are the lifelong relationships that you develop and I'm so proud of Jens and, and what he's done and what he's accomplished and it's my great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk to you today uh, sort of out of the mainstream of arthroplasty surgery but into the into the area of coding and comorbidities and morbidities and complications and you might say well why is that why is that important? Well I got an email this morning um, uh, Paul you'll like this from uh, Carlos Lavernia, and he said, Harry, I'm going to the RUC meeting in Tampa for the next two days, and they're going to decrease reimbursement for physicians by 30% for primary, and, uh, primary hip and knee arthroplasty. And that's down from 50% where it had been previously, and it probably will end up somewhere between 15 and 20%. So we are obviously at a very, uh, at the crossroads, uh, I think, in American medicine as it relates to what's coming in 2014 with, a, with Obamacare and uh, with the fact that we just can't afford <clears throat> with our fiscal deficits all that we need to provide to all of our people. So that just as a, as a backdrop and I'll talk more about some of the connections with uh, your fine program in Boston later this evening as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, a series of studies, and I, I mentioned uh, some real important co-authors here. Kevin Bozik, who's been uh, running our little uh, group that we have, and I'll give you the members of this group. We have an arthroplasty study group, and we get together and we come up with these great ideas, and then we go off and study them, and then we come back and think about them and do the others. Ravi was one of our fellows, one of our, uh, Sean was one of our, uh, one of our students. Vanessa works with Dr. Bozik and does a great job, and again, some other uh, researchers. And so we looked at uh, the, uh, we asked the question is how valid is the administrative data in um, predicting the comorbidities in patients? So why is that important? Well, administrative data is how we get paid, how the hospital gets paid. 
And without appropriate administrative data, uh, you don't know how well or sick your patients are, and therefore, if your outcomes are somewhat of an outlier, you know, you may claim that it's the fact that your patients are sicker than everyone else's patients, or, uh, but you don't have data to support it. So that's really the backdrop for why we did this study. So let's go back and look. What were the t top 10 causes of death in the year 1900? Uh, pneumonia or influenza? tuberculosis, gastrointestinal infections, and heart disease. And if you look on the ordinate there, the number of deaths, that's number of deaths per 100,000 uh, people. And look at 2000, the year 2000. Many of the diseases that you see located on the left uh, have either changed, heart disease has gone from 137 to 192, an enormous shift. Cancer has gone way, way up, not necessarily because the incidence is any different, but I think probably the diagnosis uh, is, is different. Uh, so we uh, obviously um, are a reflection of the diseases that we get, and these are the diseases that have an impact on our, on our longevity. So heart disease, cancer, so why, is, why does every institution now have a big heart institute? Because it's so popular. So many patients have heart disease. It's such an important uh, disease to deal with. Same with cancer. And then you go down, after you go from heart disease and cancer, the other ones are quite small. Uh, uh, cerebrovascular disease, accidents, Alzheimer's, etc. And I would imagine that in, in the year 2100, it will be even a different list. So these are the comorbidities. These are the things that people come with. So let's now talk about joint arthroplasty. We have an increasing demand of total joints. In fact, we don't have enough arthroplasty surgeons for the young residents and the residents in the audience. If you enjoy taking care of arthroplasty patients, there's a real need for you if you go into arthroplasty. We don't have enough workforce to deal with the demand of our patients and uh, the numbers of patients in t uh, 2030. The comorbidities and complications obviously impact the success of total joint arthroplasty. And this administrative claims data, this data that the institution reports to the payers, is used in public health uh, services research all the time. It's used in reporting of total joint arthroplasty outcomes. And clearly, uh, with Michael Porter and some of the fine work that they're doing, it's going to be enormously important as we are paid according to the value that we provide our patients, not the numbers of jo joint arthroplasties that we do, not the fact that you can do six or eight in a given day, but the value that you create, i.e., how good are your outcomes when compared to the others for the surgery that you do? And importantly, and probably as important, how much money do you spend and what do you consume to provide that care? And that's really the basis of some of this work. So the first study <clears throat> was to evaluate the concordance between administrative claims and the clinical record. Why is that important? Well, if the institution claims that the patients have a variety of different comorbidities, the real question is, does the patient actually have them? And how good is that information? Traditionally, that information is very poor. Uh, every institution has DRG. Uh, based teams that go around and they code all of the charts and they try to get accurate information probably as clinicians, as residents at least, you're plagued by these people. They send you emails, they send you text messages, they call you. Did you mean post-operative anemia? Did this patient come in with this, that, or the other thing? And the reason they're doing that is not only to increase, to accurately uh, inc provide the information, but also increase the type of reimbursement that they get. So the fundamental question was, in today's world, are administrative claims and the clinical record, um, do they correlate? So we looked at uh, commonly reported comorbidities and complications in patients. And we did this at um, UCSF. Uh, Kevin was a resident with us. We did it in our hospital, and we chose a, a hospital, Newton Wellesley Hospital, which is part of the partners organization uh, as a suburban hospital. We looked at Comorbidities and complications derived from hospital billing records, so administrative claims, compared with the clinical records. So you had to go through every record, you had to look at all of the claims to look to see what we had. So we looked at 1,300 or so uh, joints, 500 hips and knees, bunch of revisions, hips and knees. And this is what we used. 
We looked at ICD-9 comorbidity codes, and these are all the codes in the study of residents. You can memorize all those if you'd like. But, uh, um, so, but the code description, diabetes, obesity, MI, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, all of the things that patients come with before we operate on them. And the list goes, goes on and on here. So you can see postoperatively, we looked for myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, heart failure, DVT, bleeding complications, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried to get as robust um, a cross-section of the patients. And, and then we said, OK, if this is what the hospital claimed they had from the hospital coding, what did they actually have? <clears throat> this is a lot of statistics. And uh, I'm not great at statistics, but I can at least give you a sense of what we did here. So the sensitivity were the true positives. If the patient had it, was it in the clinical chart? The specificity was, if the patient had it, was it in the administrative record, right? The positive predictive value was the portion of claims that correctly identified it, a comorbidity and complication. And the kappa, or the concordance, which is the most important here, was it was in both sources. So the patient had congestive heart failure, it was in the administrative code, and it was in the record. So that's really the most important. I'll show you a bunch of data, but then I'll, I'll always stick to this uh, as well. And if you look at the literature, anything, <clears throat> anything of a, with a kappa above 0 0.4, 0 0.45 is considered very, very relevant in this, type of, in this type of a world. So let's look at the results of the comorbidities here. So let's, you, on, on the left side, you see all the different diabetes, chronic lung disease, coronary artery disease, et cetera. You can see the number of cases. There you see the sensitivity and the specificity, the positive predictive value and the kappa values. And you can see that they, they uh, are listed here. So all of these, if you look at concordance, all of these are enormously important. And they were in both uh, places theoretically. You can see the sensitivity drops off, but the specificity, i.e., if it's in the claim, they had it. There are things that they had that weren't in the claim. But if it was in the claim, they had it. So there was actually a, a very, very high correlation. And here are the rest of them, postoperative MI, DVT, and I showed you that list uh, earlier. And I've just circled some of the ones that are uh, some of the most important. Right about here, <clears throat> uh, we start to worry about these things like renal failure, heart failure, et cetera, since the numbers seem to fall off at that point. So previous studies said that there was a very suboptimal correlation between comorbidities in the clinical administrative database. Uh, and this was reported a, a, where it looked like a, you know, a concordance about 30%. So one out of three was in both. And obviously, you see that our data was uh, clearly different. So something had happened between the prior work, which was you know, a decade and a half ago, and some of the work that we looked at in total joint arthroplasty. What happened? Well, I think we got better. Our institutions got better. And so there was, there's been a real push in, in DRG assurance to make sure that information is accurate. So why would that information, why do you want that information to be accurate? You want that information to be accurate because someday when we are all part of some national joint registry, total joint registry, and Dr. Rubash's uh, complication rate kicks out as higher than the national norm, I want someone to go back to make sure my patients weren't sicker than the national norm, right? Or there was something else that was unique. Because at some point, as you know, in Scotland and some other places, you get a pink slip from the government that says, Dear Dr. Rubash, we noticed that your complication rate is higher than the national norm. What are you going to do to change it? You have 90 days. <laughs> so you really need that information if you're going to change it, so anything. So the specificity of the administrative claims is much higher than the sensitivity However, the important take-home message is that the coded comorbidities and complications are highly accurate. If they're there, the patient had it, but often incomplete. So there's the opportunity. So they need to be more complete. So efforts focused on ensuring that the relevant complications and comorbidities are captured is critically important. Why? <clears throat> because they more precisely define the diagnostic criteria additional training for administrative people might be uh, important. So that's the DRG assurance that we have in our hospital and I'm sure you have in yours. And importantly, 
to motivate us. This is about us and we're responsible for this information. So the next time you, you don't answer the, the question from the DRG Assurance Committee, the only person you're really hurting, theoretically, is yourself or your institution because you're not providing the correct input into the data that will be ultimately uh, analyzed. So we need, to, we need to be motivated to document these very, very carefully and to be inclusive. And the most important point here is the, fast, the, the, the final one, and that is that risk stratification <coughs> is essential to accurately report the results. As you know, we're starting a national joint registry. If we don't have good information about the comorbidities of these patients, how can we possibly make any meaningful suggestions as to how best to take care of them? So we took that information and we felt that we were pretty happy about what we had. And we said, now let's go to an even bigger database. Let's now start looking at Medicare. So this is our group. Stephen Kurtz is uh, from Exponent. Kevin, Edwin Lau from Exponent. Uh, Vanessa, uh, Kevin's uh, research team, Tad Val, UCSF, myself, and Dan Barry. That's our little research group. And we meet at every national meeting and we sit down and we talk about what it is that we can do with these databases. We buy the 5%, 10% sample every couple of years, and then we just continue to mine those databases. And we can compare data from the 90s to a decade ago to current and compare and look at trends, et cetera. It's a fascinating uh, amount of work. <clears throat> it's fascinating uh, work, and it's also incredibly important. So let's now look at risk factors for early revision following primary total hip arthroplasty in a Medicare population. So these are early failures within 12 months of the procedure. So we really looked at 13 months of data. We had to look at what the patients came in with and then what happened within 12 months. <clears throat> Obviously, we know that people come with a lot of comorbidities and the patient-related factors are poorly understood. So we'd like to know what are the factors in the comorbid situation of the patient that have an effect an impact on the ultimate outcome, and the outcome here was reoperation within 12 months of the index surgery. So we looked at a 5% sample, the numbers here from 1998 to 2010, all any patient under 65 who were in an HMO and were non-US residents were excluded, and we looked at 56,000 total hips. So the purpose was to identify the demographic and clinical characteristics associated with an increased risk of revision within one year of total hip, after total hip arthroplasty in Medicare population. So these are the codes we looked at. We used the regression models to look at factors like age, gender, race, uh, Medicare status, and comorbidities. Uh, we looked at um, 12, uh, 12 months, as I said, uh, as well as pre-op um, and then post-operative. We looked at 29 comorbidities based on the uh, Charleston Index. Charleston Index looks at the risk of failure within a decade and the comorbidities and the associate associations. The Elixhauser looks at uh, inpatient. So if you would, for instance, what comorbidities would predict death as an inpatient. So we looked at a variety of different comorbidities that are in the literature. Here's our population. You can see it's a relatively elderly population. There, It's a medi Medicare population, as you would expect. <clears throat> uh, more females than men. Men don't live as long as women. Uh, primarily white. That's the Medicare population. Um, these are the comorbidity scores, so relatively sick population if you look at it, which you would expect. Most people at age 65 and greater have, uh, have medical issues. And here's just a look at some of the issues, and these are the patients that you and I operate on, right? Most of them have hypertension, three out of four. Uh, many of them are anemic. Uh, most of them have, uh, many of them, uh, one out of three have ischemic heart disease, cholesterol issues, arrhythmias, one out of four. Diabetes, one out of four, vascular disease, and the list goes uh, on and on. So this is a relatively sick patient population, right? That's the Medicare population. So here's the, here's the number. Revision within the first year, 2.03%, 2% failure within one year, uh, 1.6 mechanical complications, and 0.2, remember that's within one year, 0.2% uh, infections. That's a, those are pretty big numbers again a sick population. 
So what are the factors associated with early risk of failure within one year? And I put all the data up, and again, you're welcome to <coughs> review that. What I want you to look at are the p-values on the right and the hazard ratio. So if you have depression, you have a 1.64, you have a uh, increase, 1.64 percent increase in times increase in uh, revision rate versus a standard patient. Rheumatologic disease, uh, 1.32. <coughs> Psychosis, 1.34. Renal disease, 1.2. So the numbers continue to, you know, to, to climb, and that's, those are pretty important uh, numbers. So the limitations of this study is the comorbidities uh, were based on, obviously, <coughs> diagnostic codes. Uh, again, that's, only, that's all that we had. These were a Medicare population. Uh, but this population we know has more comorbidities. And it's, and it's unclear if these same risk factors would predict failure at five years or failure at ten years. These are failures within, within one year. The complications requiring early revision are associated with increased costs. We know that, poor outcomes. And identification of these risk factors helps inform shared decision making with patients considering elective total hip arthroplasty. So if you know that those are the major risks and you know that they are associated with increased failure, you can provide more information and inform your patient. Here are the things that you have, Mrs. Jones, that are going to have an effect on your outcome and will decrease the, your result, i.e. increase your risk of failure. That's very important information. If I'm a patient, you know, uh, scheduling elective surgery, I want to know my outcome and I want to know what my risks are. And obviously the risk stratification is, is critically uh, important. So if you have depression, a rheumatologic disease, a psychiatric a disease, renal disease, a recent urinary, urinary tract infection or congestive heart failure, you are at an increased risk for a complication within 12 months after a total joint arthroplasty. And clearly this is important. So I'm going to go through two more samples here, and then I'm going to ask the question, so what do you want us to do with this information? And then I'll show you what we did with it. So again, you see the same study group. Um, these are looking now at, this uh, study is looking at risk factors for early revision following primary total knee, right? So I don't have to go through all of this with you, but I'll just show you again. Uh, patient, surgeon, health system, devices all influence the outcomes after total knee arthroplasty. So asking the same question, here we looked at a 5% sample again. You saw how many hips were in this sample, um, but this, in these there's 117,000, so almost a little over twice the number. Same time period. And we looked at the impact of all of those conditions that I lifted and listed and developed a relative risk and a adjusted hazard ratio. There are the revision knee numbers on the top. I put the revision hip numbers just so you can refer to them. So revision knees within one year, 1.14 percent, slightly less than hips. A half of them mechanical and the other uh, one-third are infection. If you notice infections in knees, as we know, higher than infections in hips, right? Mechanical complications in hip, dislocation, et cetera, higher than mechanical complications in, in knees. <coughs> So here are the risk factors, the uh, hazard ratios there, so 32% increase if you have chronic pulmonary disease, 30% depression, et cetera, and with all statistically significant p-values. So again, another, another list. So if you have chronic pulmonary disease, depression, <coughs> you abuse alcohol or drugs, you have renal disease, you have hemiplegia or paraplegia, and, and you are obese. Uh, you have an increased risk of early revision after total knee arthroplasty. This is a different list, right, than you saw for hips. So you got a different list for hips and knees, different patient population, different demographics, et cetera. So again, risk stratification and risks in informed patients are clearly, clearly important. So patient risk factors should be taken into account when considering health care reimbursement policies for early revision. So the sicker the patient is on the way in, um, if they have an early infection, a knee or a hip, um, and if you look at their comorbidities and they're very similar to the comorbidities of the patient population, they're not a higher risk or lesser risk, you might get dinged uh, if, uh, if we move to this different payer status uh, for your outcome in that particular patient and the institution. 
So important, uh, important information. So now let's look at one last study, and then we'll see how we put this together. So let's look for the risk factors for periprosthetic joint infection and perioperative mortality. Perioperative mortality following total hips, and I can substitute total knees here if you want in a Medicare population. We have the same information. Same study group, again, uh, we, uh, we enjoyed doing this work. So here we looked at a 5% sample. We looked at 98 to 2007, followed longitudinally. We looked at all of those com comorbidities that I've listed uh, before. And the question was, was, is the presence of a comorbidity uh, during this observation period have any impact on uh, mortality or infection? So here are the, uh, here are the ratios with the p-values for periprosthetic joint infection, rheumatologic disease, that seems to be cropping up, doesn't it? Obesity, coagulopathy, preoperative anemia, diabetes, and cardiac arrhythmia. If you have any of those factors, you can see the, the adjusted uh, ratios are enormous for developing a periprosthetic infection after an elective uh, total hip arthroplasty. Again, uh, these uh, allow us to do the things that we need to do to better inform our patients. And now let's look at 90-day postoperative mortality, right? <coughs> So if you have congestive failure, metastatic cancer, psychosis, renal disease, or dementia, all highly s significant. So if, you, if your patient presents with any of these, so now let's think about it. So if your patient presents with some of these and some of those and some of the others that we've listed as highly statistically significant in predicting outcome, how do you put all of this together? How, how, how do we make sense out of this? So here's our summary. Mortality, here they are. Infection, there they are. Revision hips within 12 months. Revision knees <coughs> within 12 months. You can see some of these run through all of these. Uh, uh, there are some comorbidities that run through all of these uh, questions and hypotheses, but the question is, what do you do with all of this? Any suggestions? Well, in today's world, what do you do? You make an app, <laughs> right? So we have created an app, all right? It turns out creating an app is not real easy. It's, in fact, it, not only is it not easy, it can be done. It's relative, I mean, you know, just get the right person who knows how to write the code and you get Apple to accept it and they take a third <coughs> of whatever you make on it. You don't make anything on these, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to provide something for the clinician to be able to talk to their patient. It turns out that the FDA regulates apps for medical use. We just found that out. So, so, so not only do we have to go through the hurdles with Apple, but we have to go through now a series of hurdles with the FDA to get our app approved to be able to use so that you could theoretically use it. So here's, this is where I'll end. Here's the screenshot. So here's the first screen. You put in the age, you put in the race, you put in the height, you put in the gender, uh, payer status, hip or knee. You select the comorbid conditions, right? Check them off. <coughs> really important to do, that, to do that past medical history. Most of us don't spend a whole lot of time there, but really important to get that information. We don't have to do that. Our, our physician extender or someone can do it for us to get them all listed and then what comes up is that. So real time sitting in front of your patient you can say Mrs. Jones I gotta get over here to see it <coughs> you are a relatively low risk you're actually lower than the Medicare population risk you are uh, 65 to 69, 5 foot 2, 160 pounds, you have a elevated cholesterol and borderline hypertension. Your risk of death is less than 0.5%. Your risk of infection is 1.9%. Real-time, patient-specific data in a Medicare population. That, to me, is powerful information. <coughs> because let's take now another patient. So this patient is an 80-year-old, white, 5'2", 165, who has a cardiac arrhythmia and congestive heart failure. Their risk of dying within 90 days is 2.6 percent. You know? When that number starts getting up to like 5 or 10 percent, 
don't know about you, but I start to worry, right? That's a real number. And the risk of infection is 2.7%. That's a pretty high number. You know, we looked at our database, our MGH database, and our infection rate for primary joints is less than 0.4%. That's a big number, 2%, right? 2% of all my... 2% of all my total knees got infected. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing very many total knees. That's a, that's a big number, right? So now let's get even crazier here. So now let's take a 70-year-old with a total knee that has pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, right? That's a standard patient, right? 76-year-old. What is it, a female? Male? 76 year old male? Probably be a 76 year old female. You're not gonna, men aren't going to live that long necessarily, but you get that, that patient. That's a, that's a perfect, uh, that's a typical patient. So let's look at the numbers 1.25% um, mortality and a 3% periprosthetic infection. Well, that's a big number. So when I sit down with those three people, if I do my standard discussion with them, my standard discussion is, well, at our institution, here's our numbers for infection, here's our numbers for this, that, and the other thing, right? But it's not specific for the patient. I can now say to this patient, um, you know, Mr. Smith, here, you got some real risks here. And these are your risks. These are our risks. I'm operating on you, but you're also you know, the one on the receiving end of this. These are real numbers. And so not only do I talk to the patient, I got the family there, and then I hit a button there, I can send it, and I can print it and put it right in the chart and make it part of my informed consent, which I think is critically important. Let's look at hips. Here's a low-risk patient, so you can read the numbers there yourself. Mortality, 0.1%, joint infection, 1, and this is a 60-year-old male, 165 pounds, that has high cholesterol and hypertension, so that's the same patient that we showed with a knee, so a typical patient. Here's a patient, um, a male, 75 to 79, for a total hip who has congestive failure, hypertension, obesity, and difficulties with uh, pulmonary circulation. <coughs> and so there you see the mortality is 3.5% and the infection rate is 3.5%. Those are real numbers. Those are real numbers. Right. Now let's get a little crazier. So here's a s total hip, a male, 75, who has all of the things listed there. 7.8% and 8% mortality, right? Otherwise, the discussion with that patient is, you know, Mr. So-and-so, here are the numbers in our institution, right? And he looks, hears those numbers and says, well, yeah, I'll, I'll take that risk, right? You tell him now that you got a 1 out of 10% chance of dying, you can say, whoa, wait a minute, you know? And is this really what I want to do? Of course, they're going to say, yes, I do want to do it. But they go in because mm -hmm. they're hurting and they have to get their hip done and they're not, you know, I've never had a patient tell me. I had a 90, I had a, a 98 year old guy come to me and said, doc, he said, no one will do my hip. He said, they're worried about me dying. He said, it's okay if I die. He said, I can't live like this. I cannot live this way anymore. Please do my hip. So he did his hip. He lived to be 105. And he would send me postcards or uh, pictures of himself all around the world. You know, he was in Madagascar and he pulled his shorts up with his scar like this, <laughs> telling how, how great he was with his, uh, with his hip. But this is the kind of information and the powerful information that you can get out of this kind of data. So, <coughs> This electronic risk calculator can be used to provide Medicare patients individualized estimates of their risk of revision, their risk of infection, mortality, et cetera, et cetera. A better understanding of patient risk will facilitate shared decision making clearly. Right? We have a shared decision making program that we give to our patients, um, and it has all of those generalized risks to it. This gives you specific risk for this particular patient. And especially valuable, obviously, for elderly patients, which is who we do these operations on, <coughs> with multiple comorbid conditions who might be at higher risk for early revision. Thanks for your attention.
That's very cool. So I was playing on my iPhone uh, to calculate my risk for hip reversing the effect. <laughs> You're still young. Right. <laughs> so uh, questions, comments. Let me start off with something. Yeah, sure. Um, we've had a spine database since 1994, and uh -huh. we've um, struggled with uh, <coughs> who should put the data in. So uh -huh. it's, uh, I'd like to ask you for your opinion as to who should put the data in. When we analyzed our data input, we had... Um, uh, a couple of study nurses mm -hmm. uh, work for us, and they had an almost 100% compliance rate. Why? Because every Monday morning we checked that everything had been done. Mm -hmm. But the accuracy rate was all things considered about 65%. And that was mainly due to judgment factors where there were things where a estimation was necessary. Severe mm -hmm. burst versus not severe burst, for instance. Um, we then also looked at physician data input, and there the compliance rate after one year was in the 40th percentile. Uh, and uh, the accuracy rate, however, was in the 90th percentile. Right. Um, so we had this dichotomy, this uh, incongruence of quality of data, and uh, I'd just like to hear what your yeah. thoughts are as to who should uh, put the data in. We all have these DRG teams nowadays. Mm -hmm. Well, the institutional, uh, <coughs> each in institution has their coders. They're usually nurses, and they, they do what they uh, need to do. They they try to analyze the chart, they're very experienced. Um, they do need physician input, and we need as physicians to respond to their questions. So I think that would be the first comment that I'd make. As far as a highly specific registry, like you're talking about, a spine registry, a joint registry, et cetera, that's, that's a very important inf uh, question because that information has to be enormously accurate, enormously accurate. Uh, and it has to have the, not only the breadth of information, but the depth of information. So it has to be really deep so that you can drill down. These, these are, this type of work is good for big populations and generalities. <coughs> what you want for a, a registry is very specific. You want to a a answer a very specific question, right? A certain type of burst fracture with a certain type of intervention, what was the outcome? That's what you want to answer. So there I think uh, fellows are the best. <laughs> How many fellows are in the audience here? Any fellows? No. Good. <laughs> so the fellows should do it. No, but I think there you need, there you need someone who's motivated to do it, <coughs> um, who's incentivized to do it, because I believe incentives uh, work, and that have the, the uh, fundamental information to make the appropriate decisions to get the information, accurate information into the system. So I don't think you can use you know, perhaps a, a physician extender, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant who is highly trained in that area could do that as well. So I would say that, that those two groups uh, need to do that. We have uh, patients come into our unit, everyone, our, our goal with our registry was that the physicians don't have to do anything to get the patients in the registry. They don't have to do anything. So when a patient comes in, there's a medical assistant that evaluates them, takes the Harris HIP score, the UCLA, the WOMAC, the SF36, the EQ5D, all the stuff we want. It's done automatically. I don't have to do a thing. I get a printout before I go and see the patient that gives me all that data. And then the information as far as when that person's entered into the system is when the operation occurs. So when the operation occurs, the system goes out and grabs the operative report, it grabs the x-rays pre and post operative, it grabs the hospital record. So then that all sits in the registry automatically. So the physician doesn't have to do anything. And I think that's critically important. So it's all there. Um, so then the question is, what are the nuances? And that's where you, know, you really have to have someone who's experienced to, to differentiate the different types of. All that information you talked about to the patients do that at home before they arrive? For they the can. They can. They can do it online. We have a website. They can do it the morning of, or they can even do it if they don't have time afterwards. Now, if they don't do it, then they go on a they go on a list, and then someone makes a phone call within so many days. I can't tell you how many <coughs> days. Even 30 days, for instance, to make sure that we get the data. The least uh, compliance is with the latter. If they don't do it. So we, we try to avoid that. So we even have a, you know, our medical assistant will sit down and go through it with them, screen by screen, so that we get that information. So the medical assistant. So yeah. this is a person that's paid for by us. Awesome. Us. We pay for it. <coughs> the, the surgeons pay for it. We think it's so valuable that we need to know. We, we have to have our own data. And that data is so important that we're willing to, to pay for it. So 
Um, so for your risk calculator, mm -hmm. have you tried to substratify some of the chronic conditions like <coughs> diabetes into uncontrolled and controlled? Or with the idea that when you see your patient in a clinic, you could say this is your current risk with your uncontrolled diabetes or your current EMI, and if you were to be controlled or have weight loss, this is what your risk reduction would be. So it's a tool to motivate some kind of patient ownership of their condition. The, the answer would be we'd love to be able to do that. The qu question I would ask you is how do we get that information? So again, we're using, uh, we're using administrative claims data. It's not that deep, right? So the only way you'd get that information would be back to Jens's comment is that you would have to do a, you'd have to have a registry where you could tease that type of information out. We can't get that currently. Now, could you get that from a national database, the, the American Joint Replacement um, Registry? <clears throat> Remember, they're looking at level one and maybe level two data, which basically, you know, says which hip did you operate on and what was your primary diagnosis. So it's it's a very you know the only way you get that is by having your own registry, and looking at it, or maybe like Kaiser, like so Kaiser might have a, a broad enough and deep deep enough registry that they could get that information. We can't get that from the Medicare database, but it's a great question and we should be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with regards to depression, were you, re were you surprised with those results, number one? <coughs> number two, um, why do you suppose that is? And number three, how has it affected your practice? Um, well, I, I, th I think I suspected that as a problem before this information came out. And, you know, I, in an elective practice, you get to elect who you want to operate on. <coughs> and and my, my antennae are always up for psychiatric and other diseases, you know, and, 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 and I don't know what, <clears throat> I don't know that my antennae are better than anyone else's, but, you know, you get a comfort or an uncomfort level, <laughs> uncomfortable level with certain patients. And when that meter goes off, you know, I ask myself the question now, what's going on here? Why do I feel the way I feel about this patient? Are they not being forthright with me? Or is there something they're hiding? <clears throat> you know, when you walk in and you say, Hi, Dr. Rubesh. I understand you're here because you have a painful hip. I looked at your x-rays. I'd like to examine you. And they start to cry. <laughs> <You know? laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute. I didn't, I'm not the first person that told you this. You know you've had a bad hip for a decade, right? And it's been getting, what are you crying about, for God's sake? You know? <clears throat> What's going on here? You know, or, or, you know, the nurse practitioner or the resident will come out and say, this next one, right? This next one. <laughs> you know, I think Bob Booth has a has a great uh, great slide that you know they come out like this with an L on that. You know, there's something wrong here. Well, so I, I but I, so so the question the, the answer to the question is if I suspect <clears throat> that there is an issue, whether it and I, I can't tell you that I can necessarily diagnose depression, nor do I want to diagnose depression. But if I have if that meter goes off and I and I have a sense of concern, I will say to the patient something like this, you know, we've, we've had this discussion, but there's something I just don't understand about you and maybe about the dynamics of the family here. Uh, are you sure you're okay? Because it's a big operation, and if you got issues now, if you got issues now, if I operate on you and you get an infection, your issues are really going to be severe. So is there anything you want to tell me or is there anything you want to talk about? And oftentimes that will open the door to a little uh, insight that you might get. And when I, whenever I hear that, <clears throat> I automatically say, we are not operating on you until these issues are behind us. And also you can pick it up with medication so you can see what's going on. So we have a similar approach. You know, we get them at the front end. My concern is the revision rate at a year. What do we revise? I mean, because they have oh, a as to why, I can't, <clears throat> I, I mean, we can't do that from this particular data. We can't get to it. Mm -hmm. We can only get the fact that they were re-operated on. That's all. Again, it's, it's a limitation of the data. John, what does that Nothing. mechanical complications diagnosis include? <coughs> or is it asymptic loosening dislocation and stuff like that? Or is it include just a revision for unknown reasons like pain? Yes. <laughs> again, you can, you, we don't know. We you know. We can't tell. And, and again, that's a limitation of this type of a database versus a registry where you can get that mechanical complication. It could be dislocation. It could be a whole bunch of other things. Broken implant unlikely, you know. 
broken wires, plate, you know, all those things that can occur. You, know, you can't get that from this type of data. Jen. Hi, Jen. So now that you have this great tool that provides a number and a printout and a graph that you can put in the chart, is there any risk that insurance companies can look at this and say, regardless of your conversation with the patient, they're not going to cover? Of course. Because they have a seven? Of course. I mean, they yeah. didn't have, now they have a number. Now mm -hmm. they have something easy mm -hmm. to target. Of course. That's one of the liabilities of, of having this type of information that people will be denied surgery. Without question. Because yeah. if, I mean, if you look at who do we spend our health care dollars on, we spend it on that, you know, that, that very small subset, end of life, where really sick people have big <laughs> complications, and these are big complications. So yes, there's a risk there. That's coming anyway. I mean, that's not something we're going to generate, but that, that's, that's coming anyway. We as a society have to decide, and they've decided, uh, you know, in Europe, right or wrong, they've decided that certain things are going to be treated, certain things aren't. It's going to, you know, so you're going to have a certain amount of access to care, and, and you're going to wait a period of time for your elective total joint, and you may die before that, and they agree that that's the way they're going to do it. You know, our society hasn't tackled any of those problems yet. You know, we, we can't even agree on a budget, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> Tim. So. Is there an increased risk in knees and hips? I don't know. I, I can't, you know, again, I, that's just a finding. I can't comment on whether that's the case or not. It was not, a, it was not a predictive significant factor in the hips where it was in the knees. That's just what fell out. Could be that we didn't have enough, you know, data on the hips, although with 50 some thousand, that's a pretty large number, you know. Uh, but, it, you know, we're limited by what we have. So I can't, I can't you know, you can't answer those specific questions, unfortunately. Another question from my end, um, upcoding has become a very significant issue, especially in this uh, benchmarking era where all of us appear somewhere, whether it's in the <coughs> University Health Consortium or in uh, a future uh, national hip or a knee registry. Mm -hmm. um, and comorbidities are obviously a very significant factor, as you've very eloquently shown. Um, what can society, what can databases do to prevent upcoding um, and this upcoding race to basically determine quality assessments and public perception? Well, I think um, I'd probably use the term uh, accurate coding versus upcoding. <clears throat> now, there have been certain, you know, there have been institutions and people who have, I mean, it's a federal offense to upcode, right? You're obviously using a diagnostic code to provide more reimbursement for that particular patient, I mean, that's, a, that's breaking the law. What, what we're looking at is, what we're suggesting is that they be accurately coded. And even though the DRG assurance programs feel like they're upcoding, all they're trying to do is get that information into the chart. Uh, they, they need to get that information in the chart because, yes, if the patient has another comorbidity, there is a change in the reimbursement, right, for that comorbidity. However, that's, it should be that way. They, if they're entitled to it, I mean, I, we run our own billing office in our practice and my, my, you know, charge to the billing office is leave no money on the table. Not create money, but if, if we have access to it uh, and you need to put a modifier on for that particular procedure and it's legitimate and you spent more time and did more work, et cetera, then you should put a modifier on and you should. So we would prefer not to leave any money on the table. So uh, there are, you know, this is not, I'm not, this is not upcoding, this is accurate coding. And this is capturing as much of the information as you possibly can. Because that's what we're going to be judged by. We're, we are going to be judged by our in individual data, our institution's data, our services data as compared to everyone else. And some, someday very soon, you know, you're going to get your own report. I'm already getting my report. I get a quality and safety report card. I, I get all kinds of report cards about my activity as a clinician. And this one is coming as well. And if you're an outlier, uh, you'll, uh, you'll have a problem. Uh, I'll show you, I don't know if many of you will be here for tomorrow morning's lecture, but I'm going to talk about acetabular positioning. And just by having me knowing as a clinician that somebody's looking at the position of my sockets in total hip arthroplasty, where I didn't change one thing in the operating room, maybe the other than a second look, I improved my position in total hip arthroplasty just because I knew some fellow was looking at it. 
right? <laughs> so, you know, it, there's an enormously powerful stimulus. <coughs> if people inspect what you're doing, you tend to pay a little more attention to it. What is it? People respect what management inspects. <coughs> so if you know people are going to look at something, you, spend, you, you tend to take another look and you think about it. And I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. One other question, um, an inference from your uh, talk is that uh, upfront data gathering seems to be far superior to attempts at extracting data later on from a record. No question. So um, in terms of the future of uh, healthcare, I think all of us really are going to have to strive towards having the meaningful data gathered by patients upfront, electronically preferably, yep. be uh, visible to the patient as the interactions go on and mm -hmm. uh, move on from there. Um, so, uh, you, you were talking about that a little bit there, but at this point in time then all of your hip patients will have, or knee patients will have filled out more or less an electronic data sheet before they ever Every get seen. Yeah. And you have a fever chart more or less of their outcome scores as they move on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we can, we can track them at uh, different time points, et cetera. And I mean, that's the power of a database. But these, are, these databases are enormously expensive. You know, it's a, it's a uh, <coughs> three, four hundred thousand dollar per year you know, expense to run a big database. <clears throat> that, that was the point I was going to uh, yeah. get towards, and that is for us in our spine database, it costs us about $220 a patient a year, and that was a couple of years ago. Wow. Uh, just wow. for, for tracking and uh, quality uh, uh, assurance. <coughs> so so those are substantial costs, and you identified that this is born out of your practice with diminishing reimbursements. This is obviously going to become a uh, bigger and more problematic issue. Um, what is your cost calculation? How do you figure? You know, I don't think we've ever done it on a per patient basis. I just know that it's uh, somewhere north of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year that we invest into the registry, um, and uh, a lot more up front to get it started. But then there's a lot of maintenance uh, maintenance cost uh, as well. So I can't give you the per patient information because I don't know. We probably, you know, we just dumped. Uh, eight or nine thousand patients into the national AJRR. We were one of the first hospitals to put data in. So we, you know, we probably have ten to fifteen thousand patients in the database right now. Um, so I guess I could quickly do the math, but you can do it also. It's, it's a substantial number. Yeah. That's a big number. I'm impressed to hear that. How many, how many surgeons is that and approximately how many patients per year would that be? We do about two thousand joints a year. And uh, uh, we have nine arthroplasty surgeons putting data in. Wow, that's yeah. not that many. No. I mean, surgeons. No. So well, you know, most, most arthroplasty surgeons will do, I don't do any, you know, a couple hundred anymore, but most arthroplasty surgeons will do two to three hundred cases a year. Some of the real busy ones will do five and six hundred. Some of the outliers will do a thousand. We can't do that. You know, that's a lot of work. But, but the key is, the key is that um, I'm not burdened by capturing the data. You know, I don't have to really do anything. And that was the goal. The goal was so that no one could complain about having a database, it was to eliminate as much as we could, other than the surgeons, you know, saying yes, that they'll have their patients participate and be part of the database. Could you talk now about the national joint registry? I'm assuming that the cost of that is being estimated. How are we justifying? I mean, if it costs you two, three hundred thousand a year to maintain a registry mm -hmm. of two thousand patients, how are we justifying the multiples times mm -hmm. that? Times that for the national registry? Yeah. Well, they're they're. Um, the, I'm not on the board anymore of the national registry. They're looking at different funding sources, including a per implant cost that is attached to the price of an implant, so a tax of some sort. They're looking at a variety of different models. All of the societies, the Hip Society, the Knee Society, AUKUS, we've all donated, um, you know, 150,000, I think, somewhere around that, uh, into starting it up. But the key is sustaining it, and that's where I think they're still struggling as to how to sustain a big database like that. Are, are we able to prove cost savings and how you know, either state or federal government should be um, providing funds for this if we're able to show that this Yes, they're looking at federal sources as well. And, and I think, you know, we should at institutions, since this is so important to the institution, I mean, this institution wants to be able to say that their data is such and such for femoral fractures or whatever it is. So I think the institution should also 
uh, invest in our databases and we're we're getting that to that level now to have the hospital actually invest in helping us maintain software perhaps some personnel to help us maintain the database because it's 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 the way we are going to be paid in the future we're going to be paid not for volume it's it's the it's the foot on the gas and the foot foot on the brake at the same time you know we want to curb healthcare expenditures so how do you do that well you do less surgery but we have patients who need more surgery so you have to do more surgery more effectively with more uh, cost conscious with better outcomes that's a, and that's not an easy nut to crack that's a difficult proposition so two more questions uh, Rick and then uh, TJ just in, in, oh. just to follow up on that I mean, general arthroplasty has an article out recently that looked at the volumes and expenses of joint replacement after the FPSR fix went in and actually showed that cost of hospitals went up despite decreased reimbursements and pay to uh, surgeons I, I couldn't hear the first part. <coughs> so it, I think it was '96 they started the, the when they started decreasing the reimbursement for joint replacement. Mm -hmm. and they actually showed that cost went physician up. Physician reimbursement or physician hospital DRG. Down, uh -huh. Overall cost to the Medicare system went up. Yeah. So if they cut it again, how is that going to reduce cost if it hasn't proven fast to do that? Well, I'm not. I'm not certain. I can think like a politician. Or, um, <laughs> no, but but I you know we are we are heading to an era where things you know, I said recently, talking about healthcare reform to a friend of mine. I said to him, I said it could be worse, and he said, Harry, how could it be worse? I said I could be younger, <laughs> uh, you know, because because it's uh, we are you know things things are changing and will change dramatically. I mean, just read the Wall Street Journal, New York Times to see what, pay, what employers are doing now, what institutions of edu uh, higher education are doing now, limiting their faculty so they don't have to pay health care insurance and health care. I mean, this is, uh, this is a very disconcerting time. And it's, and it's gonna get, it's gonna get harder before it gets easier. You know, maybe a single payer system that we all wanted to avoid many years ago. I remember, I think I was in high school, I wrote a paper was when Kennedy was talking about a single payer system and I, I was against a single payer national health care system. I remember <laughs> writing an essay in high school about it. I haven't changed my thoughts on it though since all those years, but maybe that's where maybe that's where we need to go. You talk to your your colleagues in Canada, I mean they say that if I do a total hip I get paid eight hundred bucks for it. I turn in one piece of paper, I got you know, medical malpractice insurance is fifteen or twenty thousand a year. I don't know what it is. Anybody might know the number, but it's <laughs> inordinately small. I have a decent practice, I can titrate my, my, uh, my uh, income according to my activity, you know, I got work hour restrictions so I can't work as many hours and that's my life and I'm happy with it. Well, I mean, that's, that, may be, that may be where we're going. That's not the practice of medicine that I wanted, but that may be where we're going. So last question, Rick. Thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation. Thanks. You cogently made the case that we're headed toward an increasingly data-driven world out there. Uh, and in the shoulder world, many of the most successful arthroplasty databases are funded, as you mentioned, by a tax on the implants that the implant vendors pay. Yep. Your group is to be commended on the registry steps that you've taken. My question is, how close are we in getting Zimmer and the Pew and Comedic and everybody else to <coughs> pay that tax in a way that we can support national databases uh, effectively without putting the tax on the hospitals or on the individual physician practices. And it seems to me that that's where the money should come from, and it needs to come to a group like the one you're setting up uh, that would be independent of their administration, but not independent of their funding. Yeah. Well, the the Harris Joint Registry, which is uh, our registry, you know, Bill Harris put a lot of his own resources uh, through his foundation and also through our laboratory. So we, we really believe in that and continue to fund that because it's what we do and what we think, you know, we should be doing. And we write a lot of papers from our registry and it's, a, it's, it's an incredibly powerful academic tool. As far as the National Joint Registry, I can't tell you uh, what, you know, they're looking at a variety of different funding sources. I can't tell you which one will be the final one. But ultimately, you know, if the, the implant manufacturers are uh, pay a tax per implant, 
It's just like anything else. Ultimately, we're paying for it. <laughs> so eventually, you follow that dollar, we're going to end up paying for it some way. So, so um, yes, it has to be funded. We have to feel like there's a creative way to fund it. I think the federal government should fund it. And I think it should be at an arm's length, but I think there should be you know, there should be funding, just like funding for the NIH, there should be funding for national registries and a whole variety of things. I think that's a very important uh, aspect of understanding healthcare in this country. And um, so I think it should be at the federal level. But, you know, you worry about, you know, I'm, I'm from the government, I'm here to help concept, which I'm, I'm certainly not an advocate for that. But I think that's the best way to do it personally. As you say, if the government pays for it, then that means we pay for it. We ultimately pay for it. That's right. Well, fantastic. Yeah.